So at this time, I just ask if there's any comments on the consent agenda. Um, my only comment is I tonight am going to be voting no on item D, not because I'm not supportive of the um, conference center expansion, um, but shortly after the election when sales tax did not pass, I had sent an email to the city manager to say I didn't feel comfortable um, voting on any large allocations of money until we put all of the projects down on a piece of paper and compared their priorities to one another because we're not going to have enough money to do everything. So I'll be voting no on item D. Okay. Ask for a motion. I move we uh, accept the consent agenda. Second. Call the roll, please. Mayor Dodson. Yes. Commissioner Reddy. Yes. Commissioner Butler. Yes. Commissioner McKee. Yes, on all but item D, no. Commissioner Morse. Yes. Motion carries five to zero with the exception of item D, which carries four to one. No, go to uh, section five, which is a public hearing. And this is to consider vacating a utility easement near the College Hill Early Learning Center. Good evening, Mayor. Commissioner Rollout, Director of Public Works. Um, we have a request from the school district uh, to vacate a five foot wide uh, utility easement that has no public or uh, private utilities such as West Art Kansas Gas or AT&T. None of them are located. All of them have signed off on the easement. Um, it runs north south on the property. Um, and there's no benefit to us. We don't need it, and neither do any of the utility companies uh, that would have rights uh, to uh, be in there. Uh, hence, our recommendation is to vacate it. Uh, Mayor, I, find, I move that we find that no private rights will be injured or endangered by such vacation and that the public will suffer no loss or inconvenience thereby and approve the first reading of an ordinance vacating a portion of the public utility easement of Lot 16 Hillview Track. Second. Second. Call the roll, please. Commissioner Reddy. Yes. Commissioner Butler. Yes. Commissioner McKee. Yes. Commissioner Morse. Yes. Mayor Dotson. Yes. Motion carries 5 0. Now go to item 6, which is the general agenda. And item A is to consider an ordinance number 7465. In 2016, the city commission wanted to address uh, e cigarettes, so we adopted a similar ordinance that for the most part mirrored the no smoking ordinance that passed in 2008. Um, but here's going to be an overview of, of the ordinance and kind of what it all entails. But generally it uh, prohibits smoking in enclosed areas. That's uh, public places, places of employment. Uh, there's many li lists there. Uh, we brought that to the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board and they recommended um, a full uh, prohibition of, of smoking and vaping throughout all city uh, park and recreation trail properties. Um, back in 2008, there was at least one uh, retail tobacco store in existence. The, the ordinance that passed by the citizens prohibited smoking in retail tobacco stores, which is why in Manhattan uh, you don't see smoke shops where you can smoke inside or hookah shops or things of that nature. In 2016, um, we were in a little bit different circumstances. We had at least three e-cigarette stores at that time who were allowing uh, vaping to occur in their stores. And at the time, a majority of the city commissioners wanted to uh, continue to allow vaping within those stores. So that was actually exempted in the 2016 ordinance. Jumping forward to today, when we combined them, we really wanted to treat them equally. So it was a question of whether to uh, not allow uh, smoking or vaping within retail stores or to allow them um, in both. And a majority of the commission was in favor of uh, prohibiting them in retail tobacco and retail vaping stores. So that is reflected in the, the ordinance that was passed at first reading as well. Jumping to non-enclosed areas, which has come up uh, recently after the first reading has passed, um, the ordinance that was passed at first reading uh, prohibits smoking within 20 feet of any access point of a building or facility. So that could be a doorway or a window. Um, the 2008 ordinance only said 20 feet from an entrance. Uh, the access point is, is consistent with the state law. Uh, so there was some ambiguity there that we cleaned up. Um, areas of food establishments such as patios and outdoor dining, uh, that would be prohibited uh, within the ordinance that was passed at first reading. And then we have a couple of lists of other areas where we get into some 
uh, you know, disagreement or you know, questions from the public is related to that food service establishment in the outdoor patio or outdoor dining area that's connected to those, that food establishment and that licensed premise. We, we talk about licensed premise in the ordinance and that generally means a, a, a drinking or establishment that serves alcohol. So the state law, and I'll address that here in a bit, but the, so the state law uh, has a 10 foot from any access point rule. That's the minimum standard that all cities have to comply with. In 2008, uh, the ordinance that was passed by the citizens uh, actually increased that to 20 feet, uh, and that was the entrance uh, that was used, but we're, we're clearing that up to use access point now. So there's a couple options that uh, commissioners can uh, do for the second reading, and uh, they could maintain the prohibition on, on smoking and vaping in patios and outdoor dining areas um, as it was uh, drafted and um, passed in the first reading. You could remove uh, that um, and, and not uh, prohibit smoking and vaping on patios, and then you would do what we've been doing for the last uh, 10 years, which is defer to that 20-foot rule. It would be 20 feet from any access point as opposed to any entrance, but that is uh, what would be that was what that is how you would enforce smoking and vaping on patios you could also remove the prohibition on patios um, but then change the ordinance to mirror the state law and use the 10 foot rule uh, from any access point 20 feet um, you know there are a lot of maybe outdoor patios out there that are smaller than 20 feet so in effect if you kept it how the the way it is it would essentially be prohibited in an outdoor patio if it wasn't uh, if it was less than 20 feet in diameter from from that entrance at this point uh, anyone wishing to make a public comment please come on up good evening um, uh, I'm Dennis I am the director for the Aggieville Business Association so uh, uh, as a uh, we did have a statement here uh, that I sent but the uh, Aggieville Business Association Board of Directors strongly disagrees with your inclusion of patios in the in the new smoking vaping ordinance we're very concerned that this is an unnecessary overreach that will create another negative impact to our local businesses that are small businesses that we're celebrating today. Uh, we would rather the city ordinance align itself more with the business-friendly Kansas state ordinance. Uh, my name is Stan Watt. Uh, in 2008, I served as the chairperson for the Clean Air Manhattan the group that created and promoted the current non-smoking ordinance. Uh, and this ordinance was overwhelmingly approved by the citizens of Manhattan and, and implemented in 2009. And as Commissioner McKee pointed out, on the ballot, it was very clear that patios would be included in that. The citizens of Manhattan expected the patios to be included in that. Uh, this, this ordinance has been in effect for over 10 years now and has worked very effectively. Uh, there's some discussion, there was discussion at the time that the ordinance would decline the businesses, particularly for the bars and, and uh, restaurants, and we found very clearly that this has not been the case. For as many people that might not go out to eat, there's much many, there's as many if not more people that go out to eat because they ha can not have to experience uh, clean air. All right, we'll close public comment and come back to the commission for discussion. What numerous studies have found is that within, if you're within two to three feet of a smoker and outdoors, it is no different than being in an enclosed area where several smokers are smoking. Absolutely no difference. And even as you move away from the smoke, you still risk exposure to it and no amount of secondhand smoke for any amount of time has positive health consequences. They're all negative. And so when people talk to me on this issue about choice and individual rights, that is what people who smoke in public prevent me from doing. If I happen to be in a public place and I just happen to walk by someone who's smoking, that person just made a health decision on my behalf. I didn't have a choice to make that decision. They made it for me. 
And so while I'm sympathetic to the arguments of the bottom line of your business, I don't think the bottom line of businesses is more important to protect than public health. And so therefore, um, I am supportive of the ordinance because I think it lives to the spirit of what voters originally voted for, and I think it better protects public health. Yeah, my thoughts haven't changed from the first reading. I voted against it because I, I see it as an overreach, and, and, and I'm not a smoker, and I don't vape, and I don't like it. And I voted for the ordinance in 2008 because I didn't want people smoking in the restaurants. But, but, but I think what happened, even if the intent, and that's another one that I'm not going to buy into, I don't know what the intent was. You know, I read the thing. You know, to me it was we were banning it inside, not outside. I think what we've got is working, and I was all for consolidating these ordinances, but, but now we've gone overboard. And it seems like maybe the next step here is just put a sign right next to our uh, you know, uh, uh, cell phone ordinance so that when you come into the city, it says, smoke-free Manhattan. Can't smoke anywhere. Because what I see happening, this gets passed like it is. Uh, the money invested by the small businesses there you know, goes out the drain, and people are going to move out on the sidewalk, and, and that's going to be a problem for me. Because they're all going to be out on the sidewalk, and now I am going to inhale the secondhand smoke. I'm not doing that right now, but I will be shortly when this passes. I make the motion we approve Ordinance Number 7465, amending Article 3 and repealing Article 4 of Chapter 17 of the Code of Ordinance to combine the smoking and e-cigarette ordinance with the deletion of Section 17-192B of the proposed ordinance that prohibits smoking on patios. Second. Call the roll, please. Commissioner Butler? Yes. Commissioner McKee? This would be for patios, not smoking. No. Commissioner Morse? No. Mayor Dotson? Yes. Commissioner Reddy? Yes. Motion carries three to two. We'll now move to uh, item B which is to consider approving Warner Park Memorial Master Plan. And the presenter is Alfonso Levio. So for this presentation, I want to do uh, review the master plan draft document as presented to the Park Board on, number, on November 4th. Uh, discuss a little bit about the Park Board recommendation and feedback. Uh, look at the Warner Park Road options and then a recommendation. And so this is the Warner Memorial Park Master Plan as proposed by the, uh, by the Master Plan that was presented to the Park Board on, no on November 4th. And so this is what was recommended by the Park Board back in last year in October. And so this was the new restroom shelter and expanded parking over on the northeast side off of Shuss Road. Uh, leaving the uh, existing nine hole course and not expanding it. Uh, improving the trails that, that are uh, around the, the park. Uh, also looking to um, uh, consolidate some of the trails and the cross country route. And that's something uh, that we would want to do uh, for maintenance purposes. Another item that was approved then was also the, uh, the new rockery gardens. And those are uh, erosion control measures throughout the park. Uh, one, of, one of the items that uh, uh, that was recommended as well is the the ravine bridge on the south side and that was to complete the loop around the trail uh, throughout the in, tw in 2017 uh, when uh, we sent out uh, a community survey that was one of the top items that people wanted to see was a loop around the park and so that bridge would uh, would help uh, achieve that and then we also look at new pollinator meadows. So this is a measure that we uh, internally, uh, including the, the you know, park staff, uh, we wanted to um, look at uh, Warner Park as, you know, as, as it was intended as a natural park. Um, we had a study actually from, one, uh, from a student, a landscape architecture student, uh, which involved um, uh, the uh, uh, diversity of the biodiversity uh, in the park. And so uh, they had recommended uh, ways that we could uh, uh, plant uh, new vegetation. Uh, we could do uh, some different haying uh, um, uh, measures. Uh, right now we hay uh, the park about once a year. 
In some locations, we could uh, extend that to two years. It would still combat the, the woody vegetation, uh, but it would leave that, uh, that uh, uh, biodiversity. And then uh, it was also, um, it wasn't discussed as much. What was discussed was the, was the disc golf uh, at this point. But throughout the process, throughout the master plan process, what we heard is uh, uh, no one was in favor, really, of opening up the, the, the road. That was something that we heard. Uh, uh, many comments from the neighbors. Uh, many of the neighbors uh, still remember back when the, when the uh, road was open and when there were parties in the park you know, in the uh, 80s and, and early 90s. Um, that road was closed in 1990 by park staff. Uh, later, uh, in 1996, uh, when there was uh, um, some uh, activity to, to really uh, redevelop Warner Memorial Park, that came up again. And the commission actually uh, um, favored uh, not opening the road at that point. So in the discussion that happened earlier this month, um, the road came up again. Uh, one, uh, and and the, the, the recommendation that the park board gave was to approve the Warner Memorial Park Master Plan as presented with the exception of reconsidering open up the road to the extent of Concept B. And now I want to show you a couple of pictures so we can get an idea of what, what, what's happening here in Warner Park. So this is the existing shelter that is right here, right in the middle. That's the existing shelter right there. This, these were built back in the, uh, in the 50s, uh, 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 early 60s. Um, and these were some of the shelters that, that were vandalized quite a bit back in the 80s. Uh, one of the shelters, uh, for, well, one of the restrooms further uh, north of this area had to actually be removed at that point. So throughout the conversation at Park Board, what was discussed was, all right, we wanna, we wanna make the park more accessible to the community. How do we do that? What's the point of opening the road? You know, do we, do we go back to the intent from the 1950s and open the road to the full extent? Or do we open it enough to, to a point that makes sense? So this existing shelter. And so this is that little area where Concept B is recommending uh, the turnaround. And so one of the implications that we look at, if you could tell here, uh, as proposed in Concept B is there would be quite a bit of uh, regrading that would have to occur. We'd have to go in with some, uh, um, some of the new gravel. Uh, we would have to address some of the, uh, uh, the drainage uh, to be sure to keep that, that drainage. We'd have to put in a couple of pipes under any kind of uh, a roundabout in this area. So this is where that area right around where B is it's about, uh, about 80 to 100 yards from where the shelter is. You can't really see the shelter. So with the direct implementation of the recommendation from Park Board to extend the road to Concept B, uh, we would also want to look at uh, possibly putting in a trail or a sidewalk to, to access, to access uh, that shelter. Throughout the discussion at Park Board, uh, it was also discussed, um, you know, could, is there a way that we could test opening the road? Is there, is there a way that, um, uh, that we could implement this? Well, there would be, and the easiest one would be if we went tomorrow and just opened up the gate. And it would be in use as it was intended in the 1950s. However, there's also implications with that. Because then, if we open up the road, how do we keep people on the road? And so right now, where the existing uh, parking lot is, uh, there's quite a bit of uh, limestone around the, uh, around the border, and that's to keep people out of the park. Because that was one of the other things that, uh, that uh, occurred back in the, in the 80s and such. People were going out there in their 4 by 4s and, and doing donuts and, and really tearing up the prairie. So with any of these options of opening up the road, we would need to consider um, how, how do we keep people on the road. Uh, the recommendation by the park board was to to uh, extend the, the road opening to concept B, which is around this area. However, uh, once we had, uh, once we discussed internally, you know, what, what's, what, what's the point of opening the road? We wanna make more accessible. We wanna get people somewhere, and that would be the shelter. And what would make most sense? And that would be, uh, and, and the more cost effective, uh, 
something that's not as disruptive to the drainage and to the grading. And that would be to uh, put in parking just to the, uh, to the north of the shelter, kind of there in the picture where I had uh, my car. Uh, it's uh, relatively flat. Uh, we would go in there, uh, scrape out uh, you know, a 20 by uh, uh, 50 area for, for maybe about five vehicles and a little turnaround that, in that area as well. So with this option as well, you know, if we open up the road, how do we keep people on the road? And again, those would be some of the same measures, so limestone, uh, some sort of metal fencing, maybe some posts and wires. And it wouldn't have to be throughout the whole uh, uh, road. There are areas where the ditch does uh, go down quite a bit. Um, maybe those vehicles with a little bit bigger tire uh, could get through it uh, for sure. And so that's where we're at. Uh, the recommendation really, we're looking for feedback on the Warner Memorial Park Master Plan, uh, specifically on the motion set forth uh, by parks, uh, by the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board. Um, you know, we're looking, uh, you know, do we, do we keep the road closed? If so, then let's move on. If we want it open, all right, but to what extent? Good evening. My name is Debbie DiVenuto and I live in Northeast Manhattan. For the three people that are new that don't know me, I am Kern Warner's great-granddaughter. I am the advocate for the road. Um, I fully approve this plan right here. I think this is great. The one thing I wanted to point out that I pointed out to the park board the other night, which by the way, at the park board advisory meeting, I was the only person there. There was not a resident one there. In fact, I found it ironic the gentleman there was there to uh, present about the pavilion over at the city park ended up speaking up for opening up the road. So either I talked really good or he, he heard what I was saying really well. But right now, if you take this road out, this is the only part of the park you're using. 20, 30 acres. You can't get up here. This park was paid for by the community. It's a community park. It's not a neighborhood park, it's a community park. It's supported by tax dollars. Every taxpayer has a right to go into that park and to go into whenever they want. I don't want to have to call and get a key so I can drive in because I can't walk in there because of a bad hip. So I'm Brenda Bandy. I live at 3005 Cherry Hill. And there are two points that I'd like to make just to raise awareness. And that is um, that the road is accessible right now. Anyone can come and check out a key. Just as if I wanted to use the shelter at the Points Avenue shelter, I have to make a reservation. These are public facilities that do require a level of reservation or access. And we have that process in place. We have the process in place where somebody can get a key. The road is open. And I can tell you as a person who lives near the park that there have been weddings that have taken place down at the end of the long road that um, goes all the way towards the end. If we limit the parking area and put boulders in there, that's actually gonna limit and restrict access all the way down to where we call it the Boy Scout path um, that connects. So I think the existing road actually gives greater access to people who want to use it for events. Good evening, my name is Greg Spaulding. I live at 3707 Bradford Terrace. Uh, I live on the park. Uh, first of all, I wanted to thank the city and I wanted to thank the park. Uh, commission for for the work that they do to preserve this this park. It's a it's an amazing park uh, And as in your own literature, it says it is a gem. It's primitive. It's a precious resource of open space. I Think that's a great description of it. The master plan calls for maintaining it as a natural and rustic with minimum development to me Having cars and roads through this precious resource goes against the objective of the master plan to maintain it as a primitive natural resource. Back to the commission for discussion. I have a quick question. Is the gravel road that exists there now, was that also the original road that was there? Or yeah. did, was the original road paved and we like broke it up? No, uh, that's the original road from 1959. So the, okay. yeah. Okay, so I guess I'll go ahead and start my comments. I, to me, that's the exact point of, if we open up back that road, I wouldn't expect us to pave it or do any kind of additional 
work. Um, so, d I mean, if, if your concern is about preserving the nature um, of the park, then opening up the road doesn't change what's already been developed. I feel like because we passed a master plan that eliminated the expansion of disc golf, we took around a lot of the other amenities that we had originally been planning, opening up the road to where option two, I believe, just past the existing shelter is a good compromise um, to where this becomes a little bit more of a, a park that's um, accessible by the community. And particularly, I actually think that this is a much bigger ADA issue than it is anything else. If I'm in a wheelchair or I have a disability, there's no way for me to enjoy any part of Warner Park in its current state, um, and that's an issue. I. Um have been an advocate in the past for keeping this park closed. Um, and, but I think it's time after 50 years to try to open it to, on a limited basis. And I basically agree with what Jared just said, that we try it and if it doesn't work, we close it again. And I wanted to stay focused a little bit on the budget end of this. This is a master plan. So what we're voting on tonight here is not to fund a road or new park benches or anything else. It just means that the intent is to eventually do that. And that might not happen for a couple of years based on our budget constraints. So, so you know, that, that's where I'm at. I mean, a master plan is basically the ideal state where you want to be in some future, and that could be 10 years out. And, and unfortunately, this could wind up like the bridge that was mentioned because there is no, there is no money for it. And so uh, based on that, you know, if there was a monetary price tag on this tonight, I might look at it differently. But, but I understand it's just a master plan, and, and hopefully, you know, you know, with Eddie's great management of the park system, uh, this will eventually get put in place in some fashion with the details. So if people are dissuaded from the use of the park, it's largely due to I don't have any place to park. Now, secondarily, you have to ask yourself, what are you accessing? What is it I'm doing when I go there? You know, what is there to do? You're not going there to the swimming pool. Uh, you're not going there to play tennis. This is a different kind of park. And I just, the, the, the part that is onerous, once you take that gate off, then it's done. You're gonna ask the RCPD to do it. You're gonna ask the Parks and Rec, well, why don't you just send a guy up there to close that boom at uh, at sundown I mean these are all expenses that we don't want the as some people pointed out we already have access all you have to do is go to the city website and get the, get the key if you want some kind of an event of a, a wedding or some a boy scout event up there that's what the place is made for you know we don't contemplate having hordes of people go around that's not what it's for it's a quiet place where there's birds and animals and so on that you can walk through. So I don't like either one or two. I just want to keep the thing the way it is. I'll make a motion. Uh, Mayor, I move that we approve the Warner Memorial Park Master Plan dated November 2019 as recommended by the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board, which proposes opening Warner Park Road to the extent shown in option two. Second. All right, call the roll, please. Commissioner McKee? Yes. Commissioner Morse? Yes. Mayor Dotson? No. Commissioner Reddy? Yes. Commissioner Butler? I guess yes. Motion carries four to one. This is a discussion item. It'll be the overview of the Manhattan Rental Housing Forum held on October 27th discussing on improving the tenant landlord relationship and other issues related to rental housing and it's Marshall assistant city manager and so we wanted to highlight for you was that the city commission um, directed the city staff to do some engagement throughout the city to understand what the landlord tenant relationship is and some of the resources available and so we worked in partnership with the student government association at Kansas State and we held a rental housing forum on October 29th on the K-State campus in the K-State Student Union. And the goals of the, um, 
forum were pretty simple, really to understand the landlord and tenant perspectives on rental issues in Manhattan, as well as raise awareness about resources that are available to enhance a tenant-landlord relationship. As we highlighted back then, the recent numbers from the rental registration program is there currently are 13,387 dwelling units registered in the program from 1,800 owners, which represent about 4,800 actual addresses in the community. And so also we highlight that our risk reduction department is doing the registration violations, but that could be for some of the code enforcement services related to yard landscaping, but also the housing violations. And then even how they uh, implemented one court action. And so what I want to highlight for you now is the uh, information that K-State gathered from the renter community. And you'll see there are 143 respondents, 60 were students, and about the other half, there are 59 that were staff members. So keep that in mind as you think about some of the data that we go through here. Um, again, some of the students were older, juniors and seniors, and you see the breakdown by male, female. Here's the number one concern. We talked about what is the decision factor that goes into the renters in Manhattan from this sample. And so price matters. Price was the number one issue as to how people found their housing in Manhattan for this group. Then also you look at the second one was overall condition. They kind of made an assessment, is this the overall condition I want to live in? We asked a simple question, do you read your lease agreement? And 89% of the respondents said yes, they do. So we thought that was important to make sure that people are understanding how they go in to the tenant-landlord relationship with the lease being the basis of that. Also, we asked, do they do a walkthrough, and are things documented when they go through the walkthrough? And so, um, some said yes, and it's documented 60%. They said yes, but it was not documented for 12% of those, and then no for 28 of the respondents. Well, we also found out, and this was in a headline after the forum in the Manhattan Mercury, where the respondents of these renters said they did not know that the city had a rental inspection service or that you could call and require or ask a free inspection. So that was uh, eye-opening, I think, for me and for some of the students there and other renters. Then we kind of went into how do they view the unit that they currently live in. 75% of them said that they're extremely or somewhat satisfied. And there are also 11 respondents or 8% that were extremely dissatisfied. So you kind of get a sense of people generally like the unit that they're in. And so what we saw, talking with K-State, some of their key renter takeaways is that websites are a commonly used tool for rental property. That's how people go and find basically their main resources. And we talk about resources, the website seems to be it. Renters care more about price and condition than location. We wondered if location would rise or not. And then um, the vast majority, as we highlighted, don't know that Manhattan has a voluntary rental inspection program. And then again, 25% witnessed the landlord retaliation. Before you move on, who took this survey? Was it pe the people who came to the forum, or was no, it different? this was beforehand. SGA sent it out. It was in KSU Today was one of the forums. SGA's network of social media and other things. So it was student-promoted and K-State administration promoted. Did they gather any demographics when they did that? Uh, we got the year in school, male, female, and faculty staff. Okay. So yeah, I can give you some more of the detailed background on it. We went to the landlord, and we used, uh, again, the landlord uh, database of 1,800 emails. And from that, looking at the demographics, we got back 129 re 29 responses, and we asked if they were actually property owners, or if they worked for a property management company, or if they worked for a real estate company with property management, to kind of really get down to some of the demographics of who is replying back to us. And so 107 of them are the actual physical property owners. Then we also asked, what is the makeup of their tenant? We offered a couple categories, but the majority, 53%, were KSU students. Not surprising. When we hear about the tenant-landlord relationship, a lot of times people think it goes sour, and so people don't get their safety deposit back or security deposit back or cleaning fee or whatever damage deposit. And so 68% of the landlords say they almost always have returned the security deposit. Did we ask that same question to the tenants? That one we did not so what is so. my what is my incentive to tell you that I did as a landlord to tell you that I didn't return part of the security deposit other than just being nice and honest like any survey okay you, like any survey in that regard and then we also talked about some people say the term slum landlords are not maintaining their units we think the conditions aren't up to standard 
And so we really kind of wanted again, get just what their impression was, and we gave them a range of how many dollars they spent annually to maintain each individual unit, not just as a whole. And so you see the responses there, about 58%, you take the last two columns there, spent more than $1,000 per unit per year. And some report they spend that more than 1500 That could be a new stove, that could be a cleaning service, that could be new windows, it could vary. But it at least says overall that the landlords are telling us they are investing some amount in their unit each year. And then we wanted to just kind of get a sense, are renters being evicted? And so we asked over the last two years, how many have they evicted? And it said 67% uh, had not had to evict or terminate in the last two years, anyone from their units. And they had some others who did one and whatever, but here's the reasons why. And basically 84% of the renters were evicted for failure to pay rent. And so that was the leading indicator, but you see some others, property destruction, illegal activity, whatever it may be, but the primary one was failure to pay. And here's the key, uh, key landlord takeaways. Landlords are on social media. This is where we think is a good place to build the tenant-landlord relationship. Landlords are investing their properties each year. Nearly 70% have not evicted or canceled a lease. 66% have concern for the local rental market. 73% say the housing quality is good or excellent. And 97% think that their units are good or excellent. So then um, kind of the overall, I'll invite um, Jansen Penny, the student government president at K-State, and Justin Watkins, the student um, chair of the SGA Intergovernmental Relations Committee to come up and join me and give you their perspective as an overview. But we have on here kind of the overall panel form and takeaways. When we had the panel discussion, there was some robust conversation. And I do want to again thank um, K-State for their partnership and collaboration on this forum. Um, for the student government to work hand in glove with us and help, I think it provided for a more robust um, forum and input. And I think um, we all walked away better for it. And I think these are the um, takeaways that uh, Justin can talk about and he has some proposals from the K-State perspective. Yeah, absolutely. So um, as you can see here, um, property uh, management is consistently changing hands. Uh, the Manhattan rental property don't appear to have a large uh, presence on the internet and resources are lacking for tenants. Uh, other communities and universities have other resources and are easier to find. AC doesn't provide adequate services for off-campus housing. Um, we do have an off-campus uh, resource uh, student worker who works 10 hours a week um, that has kind of been in question about how adequate that is um, the city needs to do a better job highlighting its rental inspection service um, that's was shown in that survey 75% uh, of people didn't know that we had a rental inspection program um, the city should consider some type of language requirements and lease addendums about inspection services and laws against landlord retaliation and so we'll kind of talk about that um, so one of the big emphases that I've had um, in my time as GR chair is working to uh, help students who live off campus have the resources that they need uh, with, um, from the university and from the city. Um, and so that kind of started with uh, working with Dennis to do this off-campus housing summit. Um, and uh, overall, really just to add on that, I think we all can agree that there are areas to improve. There are areas to improve on the K-State side, on the city side. Um, as us, like me being a renter as well and being more um, informed as a, as a student renter, as a faculty renter. And so really finding out what those next steps are. And I think here are very two, um, two great Two, two great options that, that we can look at as far as moving that, moving that conversation forward. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. We're adjourned. <laughs>